Thank you. That was epic. I love that trailer so much. Our author, Chris Hewitt, uh, put that together for us because he is talented. Because <laughs> I could not do something like that. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. We are here today um, celebrating the release of this amazing book. It calls from the doors. Um, this is the hardcover. Totally got a good knock to it. And then we also have the paperback cover, which uh, both of these are available as well as the ebook is on sale right now um, through Amazon for only $1.99. So thank you so much, everybody, for um, joining. Um, at any time, feel free to say hi in the comments. We are um, going to be doing a ebook giveaway uh, live today, as well as putting everyone's name in a jar um, and doing a uh, pull on, uh, what's that word again? Oh yeah, Halloween. So Halloween is when we're going to do a grand prize. So if you get to watch us live or at any time um, on Facebook or on um, YouTube, when it gets uploaded there, feel free to put a comment and your name will be entered. So um, hi. My name is Michelle, and I am the owner of Erie River Publishing. And again, we are here to celebrate It Calls from the Doors. Now, this is actually the fifth book in the It Calls from series, which is our, I'm going to say like flagship um, book, really. It all started almost two years ago uh, when we did a call for this one, It Calls from the Forest, uh, which quickly became this one it calls from the forest volume two because we had so many fantastic stories come in um then since then we've done it calls from the sky whoa that's backwards it calls from the sky <laughs> we've had a, and then um most recently uh it calls from the sea so that's our collection and then um for authors that are watching as well we also are doing a um a story call right now for it calls from the veil so we're looking for ghost stories poltergeist that kind of creepy vibe um but today we are here to celebrate it calls from the doors um i'm just reading a little bit from the back it says open the door to your nightmares um turn the key pull back the bolt and fasten the latch and let the darkness through discover 19 tales of terror and despair that lurk on the other side of the door in this fourth installation of Erie River Publishing's horror series. So uh, this also includes um, a foreword by Dave Jeffrey, which we are so grateful to grab. Um, it's just an honor to have him do the forward for us. So we hope you enjoy this book. And hello, it looks like we've got a couple of people already, but um, hi for everyone watching. And I also want to say hi to our author. So let's bring them on. We have, I've already mentioned him. Now let's say hi, Chris Hewitt. Hi. <laughs> hi. And we've got David Green. Um, oh. And we've got Rachel Unger. I apologize. Did I say that wrong? Oh, all right, perfect. You're on mute. Don't worry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we've got Adam H. Douglas. Hello. Um, hi. And then Ali, is it Wilkes? It's Wilkes. Look at me doing names properly today. And we've got a couple of people watching. We have David Green watching. Is it the same one? It's the same one. I'm able to split myself into two to perform many tasks. Yeah. Uh, we have Emily. Hi, Emily. Uh, Wendy. I think someone might have their speaker on high. Is anyone getting a feedback? Let me know in the comments. Um, Alana and then, oh, Chris is here too. Hi, folks. <laughs> <laughs> We've already got some people saying hi. So again, anytime, feel free to, um, type your name or say hi in the comments because you're going to be entered into a draw. Um, I'm trying to see if it's me or someone else. Um, so how are you guys doing? Are you excited to finally launching this it feels like it's been forever well, i think any um i think any story that you get to see uh, actually come out is kind of like seeing your child grow up and actually go out into the world so it's always great to see 
um, then get out there and see what happens to them and see what how people react to them. Well, I think we've got like a really interesting collection of stories um, that kind of came through on this one. They're, all of them are so unique and like have different vibes to it, which is the most exciting part of having one of these anthologies is that everyone's got a different um, kind of take to the call itself. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by doing um, individual readings of the stories themselves. Um, so I'm going to take you all down. The first one that's going to do the reading is Chris, and we're going to talk a little bit. If anyone's watching, if you have any questions specifically for an author, let us know. And um, we'll get back to you. I do think someone's got feedback, so we might have to like test with everyone going on mics on mute <laughs> and see what happens. But uh, let's start. So I'm going to say goodbye to everyone right now and then uh, just leave Chris up. And he will read. Remove from stream. Okay. Goodbye. All right. Hi, Chris. Sorry. Hey. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. Good. That's great. Happy to go first. You know, you, you know me. Always the first to volunteer. Yeah. Your story, Homesick. Yeah, this is the right book. Mm. Homesick. <laughs> um, did you want to give us a little bit of a like, do you want to jump right in or do you want to talk about it a little bit first? I can do either. Which do you want to do? Pick one, quick. Read or talk about it. Read. Right. Okay. Let's read. Okay. If for any reason, <laughs> uh, scream if you need me. I'm going to be gone. Okay. Won't be long. <laughs> okay. So this is a section from uh, Homesick. Um, which is my story in It Calls From The Doors. Um, this is a little bit further in, um, and it's a short section that should give you a flavour of the story. Um, okay, so Janet turned the key in the lock, swinging open the front door and holding her daughter's hands as they stepped across the threshold. The smell of fresh paint assailed their noses. Sunlight streaming through clean, modern windows revealed pristine painted walls glossy skirting boards and polished hardwood floors. It had taken all her savings and all the money from the divorce, but Janet needed it to be their home, their new beginning. She squeezed her daughter's hands and they sprinted off upstairs as Janet floated from room to room, savouring every detail. On the landing, soothing soft hues chased away any remaining suspicious, suspicion of lingering shadows. Janet closed her eyes and soaked it in. It's my room. You wanted the other room. You can't. But I didn't realise it had an ensuite, did I? I'm the oldest. I should get first choice. Mum, tell her. Janet sighed. When she opened her eyes, heaven seemed a little darker, a little colder. Still, it was a far cry from the hell of their tiny bedsit. Four doorways led from the landing. Two bedrooms on the left, one on the right, and a family bathroom at the end of the hallway where a large roll-top bath beckoned. She followed the sound of bickering to the nearest room on the left. A sign on the door read, Private, keep out, with Anne's room scribbled underneath. Janet rolled her eyes and pushed open the door. As advertised, the large bedroom sported an ensuite bathroom and two large sash windows overlooking a tangled garden which would need attention before croquet would be a valuable pastime. Anne had stacked all her belongings in one corner of the room, and in another, Sarah had followed Sue. suit, possessions being nine-tenths their tedious ownership dispute. It was the last, latest battle in a war Janet had long grown tired of, and realising the folly of taking sides, she retreated. Mum, I don't care. Sort it out between you. There are three rooms. Last night you shared a bed, so I'm sure you'll figure it out. The door closed with a satisfying click. Janet returned downstairs, weaving through the countless boxes stacked in the front room. On her way to the kitchen to locate up a bottle of Chardonnay she brought as a housewarming present to herself. To new beginnings and peace and quiet, she said, raising a glass to no one in particular. The wine tasted sweet, going down easy, and before long she'd all but emptied the bottle. An hour had flown, unpacking, and she'd not heard a peep 
from her daughters. Even in her tipsy state, a dull alarm bell broke the silence. Girls, she called out from the bottom of the stairs. No answer. Nothing but a deafening silence. The silence she'd longed for filled her with a rising dread as she climbed the stairs onto the landing and entered the room on the left to find it empty but for a bed and a bedside table. She glanced out the only window upon the garden below. Something wasn't right. The other bedroom was the same, a bed, a table, a single window overlooking the drive. She checked the bathroom and leaned against the bath, head spinning, trying to comprehend how three bedrooms had become two. The kids had been in the largest bedroom, the one with the ensuite bathroom, two windows overlooking the garden. Now, no such room existed, and Janet fought down a rising panic. Anne, Sarah, stop messing about. Where are you? She ran her hands along the hallway's freshly painted walls. There had been a door there. She was sure of it. The rear bedroom ran the full width of the property. It left nothing for a second room overlooking the garden, let alone the ensuite bathroom she'd seen. She checked the other bedroom. Empty. Not a sign of her daughters, not even an unpacked box. They've all been piled into the disputed room. The doorbell rang and she shot downstairs, wrenching open the door. Girls, hilarious. What the hell have you been up to? She yelled at the silhouetted figure. Are you okay, my dear? said her mother, pushing past. She handed Janet a bottle of wine as she made a beeline for the kitchen, a bouquet in her other hand. I'll find a vase for these. Janet stared after her after her and at the bottle of wine before taking a moment to look up and down the street. It was a beautiful summer's day outside and her neighbours attended to their lawns and washed their cards. Children played in the streets, laughing and squealing in the sun. None were hers. Entering the kitchen, she found her mother rearranging flowers into the cracked vase, the only vase they owned. It's a lovely house. Janet wandered over to the worktop. I don't know how, but I've lost the kids. The kids? Yes, your granddaughters. Her mother placed the flowers down to scrutinise her daughter. My what? Janet stared at her mother in disbelief, the bottle slipping from her hand to explode on the kitchen floor as her world fell apart. And done. (laughs) Come back. Hello. My mic is still muted. Okay. Nope, not now. Now it's unmuted. (laughs) I like to joke where I just mute myself, then remute myself. (laughs) Great story. I love that story so much. It has, yeah, the moment uh, I read it, I was like, like I hadn't finished it. I was like, I really enjoy the buildup that this story has and the potential of. I must admit, at that point, the story could have gone in i was i knew it was i originally started writing it for a horror so it had to be a horror yeah but given that premise of her daughters have disappeared her mother knows nothing about them there's no there's no evidence of their existence there are there were other paths that weren't out and out horror you know all sort of kind of psychological thrillers you know etc etc which are kind of echoed in this one a little bit but I'd rather, you know, some of those I would have liked to have gone down, but it had to be horror. So for this one, it had yeah. to be horror. But I don't, <laughs> I think that this story diff, it definitely had like a lot of possibilities of where it could have went. Um, and I think uh, for this specific call, it went exactly where it needed to go. Which so yeah. <laughs> thanks so much. Uh, we've got uh, Emily says I love this story. Now Al- Emily uh, was one of the lucky few. Is which is one of our ARC readers. So she actually got some advanced copies of this you, one and has read all of the stories and has had some great feedback. Um, <laughs> you got, hello, ahoy. <laughs> all y'all, I don't even know how to say that. Hi, Richard and David again. Uh, oh, we've yeah. got a question here um, from <laughs> David. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It was- what inspired the story? Um, yeah. Did you receive any amazing input? No, no. If None. Like, yeah. So I, uh, David tends to be my beta reader. So um, yeah. In fact, actually, David, the one line you added to it, which at the time I did agree was a great line, got taken out by the editor because it was over the top. <laughs> 
<laughs> is that the one thing that you disagreed with? You're like, no, this should stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I wasn't going to die on that hill, as it's as it involved the description of a used condom. So I wasn't. I know what David was trying to do. He was. Oh my he, gosh, yeah. No, I wish I remembered that line. <laughs> don't, don't don't. It didn't get past the editor, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Emily would like to know uh, where did the you get the idea of homesick? Was there something? Um, um, so I was I was I was talking to my partner Wendy earlier about. I, you're going to ask me the question. I'm going to go. I don't know. But actually, um, it was in my um, things that keep disappearing period in about January and February. I wrote three stories back to back um, for various anthologies that have all come out that all had the same things like, disappearing. My stuff is gone. Yeah, like rooms disappearing, parts of the world disappearing, okay. and um, people putting people in places that didn't exist. And so Very it's cool. my things disappearing period, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> I'm over it now. You're over it. <laughs> well, it might be something you have to revisit. Yeah, well, maybe. Unless it just doesn't exist anymore. Well, yeah. Yeah, exactly. In fact, yeah. that was one of the stories was nothing existed at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, Neen mentioned that's horrific, which I think for a horror anthology and like that kind of story, you did your job. Yeah. I think this one, um, the missing children part is quite disturbing as an undertone throughout the whole thing. It really is. It kind of like goes... <laughs> well, I haven't got any children, but I know when my dog disappears for more than five minutes, I start to, yeah, hyperventilate. So I can only imagine yeah. it's slightly worse with children. If you're my mother-in-law, you'd probably be more concerned about the... Uh, I'm just... Stuck. Anyway, <laughs> it was fantastic. I know. Before I say something that's going to be on the internet forever. Um... <laughs> I really loved the story. So thank you so much for um, just right. a reading and coming um, and everything else. But uh, um, submitting always. We actually had this uh, conversation in the private chat. This, you have been in every single one of our anthologies. Our, uh, yeah. Calls from. yeah. You got into it calls from the doors. No, sorry. Yeah, obviously. Um, <laughs> but you're in the sea, you're in the sky, and you're in forest volume two. So thank you. You, no, thank you. Thank you. It's like the hat trick plus one. So there's no pressure for Veil at all. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Veil better be fantastic. Oh, it's going to have to be, isn't it? I, I don't even possible. know if you're writing for Veil. So it's just like, anyway. <laughs> of course, I'm writing for Veil, but yeah. I mean, you have to now. <laughs> even if you become famous, you have to always write for us because you have to be in every single one <laughs> from now on. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to say um, just, again, thank you for writing and for reading, and that trailer, oh, they everyone loves yeah. it. It's, good, it's good. awesome, so thank you again. Great. And we will see you in a little bit, so I'm going to remove you from the stream. And then next one coming up, I believe we said we were going to have Rachel? Allie? I can't remember. Let me just go look back. I was trying to write it down, but then, yeah, Rachel. Rachel's going to be coming up. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you doing today? Oh, not too bad. Not too bad. That's good. Um, thank you for so much for being here. It's always nice to like be able to put um, a name to a face and like, because I get to read all of your words all the time, but I, I rarely get to actually like interact with you or people, but so... It's always exciting to see that. Now yours is ringing the bell. Did you want to? Um, did you want to do a little reading too, or do you want to just kind of? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, did you want? Just gonna throw you in. Cool. Sounds good. Okay. Excellent. If you need anything, just. Okay. All right. I'm going to. I'm going to start from the beginning. When things went wrong, it happened fast. I knew, we all knew, we shouldn't go into the abandoned mine. But Shane was going deeper in, almost out of sight, and someone had to call him back. Or maybe it was just that we had to see, too. Maybe we had to test ourselves, the way we were always testing ourselves, and the mine was the latest way to do it. Or maybe it was the mine itself pulling us in. 
Wait for me if you find something cool, Henry yelled as he bolted back outside, heading for his good camera in the rental car. If he'd had the better camera when we found the clearing, he and Shane would have competed for first into the mine, but photography had always come first for Henry. Damn fools going in all freaking directions, Mel huffed, slumping into the wall beside her. Shane doesn't even have a headlamp, and... And then part of the ceiling collapsed. We came from everywhere. That season had rafting guides from places like Vermont, San Diego, and British Columbia, but we had more in common than white water and muscle tone. Once our company-given camping spaces were set up in the bush, we had little to do except figure out just how far we could push ourselves. Well, we, we could drink, and, and we did, but mostly it was about pushing the envelope. One of the old-timers, on his fifth year of guiding tours, which made him nearly 30, had a thing for rock climbing. Within a month, we were constantly on the lookout for new things to climb. On rainy days, we'd drive into town for the climbing gym, roping in and racing each other, seeing who could be the first to ring the bell at the top of each route. Sometimes it didn't even have to be raining. Ringing the bell was addictive, and we had the money for gas and day passes. We bouldered, too, any time we were conscious and not on a raft with tourists, but it was ringing the bell whether we were indoors or out. When the drought closed up the shallower parts of the river, our hours dried up with it. The company let us use the campsites until the end of the season. And then, Mel found cheap tickets to Seattle. Mel was lean and savvy about anything wilderness-related. If you wanted a fire built or a river investigated before taking a tour down it, you asked Mel. There's a rainforest in a national park up there, Cat, she said. Jesus, look at this! She knew all about my plan to hike the national parks. Everyone did. I wasn't shy about it. Between her enthusiasm and mine, five of us threw camping gear and backpacks and went to the airport. Mount Rainier was covered in clouds when we arrived, but we hopped ferries and asked about breweries. Eddie took the wheel the second morning. I lived here for a bit when I was a kid. If I can find it, we're going somewhere else first, was all he said. Once we got into the forest, the service roads had numbers instead of names. The road climbed and the trees closed in. We stopped complaining about the hallucinogenic rainforest we were missing because the sun was out and the mountains were amazing. We parked at a trailhead and Eddie's sly grin became enormous. So, he said, do you want to see the crashed airplane or hike a mountain pass? We ran the first mile leaping downed logs or running along them, shouting at each other and at the wind. We took some day packs with water and food, but the bulk of the camping gear was left in the trunk. Eddie slowed at a spur off the main trail. Shane dropped him to some impossibly difficult yoga position, mostly to prove he could do flying pigeon and we couldn't. He admired his new shoes once again while down there. God, we were all sick of hearing about those shoes, but Shane was obsessed with them. Eddie glanced down both options for the path, and then pointed along the main trail. Let's go this way, he said, and away we went. We were still laughing and pushing each other when we came to the entrance of the mine. The shadowed grey stone framed an open tunnel plunging back into the rock. The ferns around the hole were almost as dark, as though the sun looked away instead of shining on their leaves. Even the birds were silent. Cool, Henry whispered already reaching for his camera, and so we walked closer. I didn't want to. Something about it was repellent, though I couldn't figure out why. Hundreds of people had probably gone into it on a daily basis back when the mine was running. It was basically just an open door. The air was so still that my skin tingled. There was probably a moment when someone could have spoken and stopped us, but it passed by in that stillness. Mel looked as intrigued as Henry, but Eddie seemed weirded out. I don't... But we never found out what he was going to say, because by then, Shane was inside. Guys, come look, he called. We really shouldn't have gone in. I don't know what we expected, but what we got was the stuff of posted warnings and common sense. There was a clack thunk of rock shifting, and we were stuck.
Hello. Hello. That was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, like, oh, sorry, I'm trying to flip back to the comments because I saw some people wrote something. Um, so we've got Emily that wants to know, why do you pick a mine? So the story is actually based off of a real place. Mm -hmm. um, back in 2016 or 2017, a friend and I were tossing story prompts back and forth between their, uh, each other on a monthly basis. And she found this place in um, Washington State. And uh, it's the Tubal Cane Mine. Okay. And there's a, uh, a crashed... I want to say it's not a B-52. I always get this wrong. It's like a crashed B-17 plane okay. that went down right there. And the mine was in production and now is no longer. Yeah. And it's a popular hiking spot. But she mentioned it and I was like, there's, there's a story there. There's yeah. something there. I love when stories can be kind of ripped out of real life and then twisted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part about storytelling is like, building on something that um you can that's tangible that you can see and that you can imagine so yeah. um i love how that uh, that comes together um yeah have you been there or was it just your friend okay. um i don't even know if she'd been there like i've, oh, I've okay. done a little bit of vacationing in washington state we went sort of along the along the ferries you know we went okay. to um san juan island and stuff like that um and it was it was a wonderful vacation but um our, our vacation went better than it did for the people in my story. Yes. Um, so, so yeah, your story is in here, obviously it calls from the doors. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm when reviews start coming in, I'm really curious to see if anyone pulls that out. Cause I thought it was like a really creepy, creepy story. I really enjoyed like where you went with it. And even the, the ending part of it just um, was just like a final beauty great note like i i really enjoyed it so i hope i hope everyone else enjoys it and again if you haven't grabbed your book yet uh it is a dollar 99 on um amazon for kindle uh we also have kindle unlimited so you can read it for free if you have that subscription um and you can get the paperback or hardcover anywhere uh books are sold all you need to do is ask your um bookstore provider just ask them to order it in or you can order it off of amazon or even through um but thank you again for reading. That was really, that was really good. I'm really glad we got to print that story because I really loved it. Did you write it specific for this call or was it something you had? Um, I think it was something I had. Um, I, I usually, I don't write fast enough for most calls. I'll see something yeah. and I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And like two years later, I'll have. You're like, oh, I finished it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally understand. I do not. I can't write quickly anymore. I can't write anymore anyways, because I'm too busy. But but even when I did, I was like getting something out in a couple months. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to say goodbye for right now. And then we are going to bring up Allie. All right. Thank you. All right, Allie, are you ready? I'm going to just... Oh, we're smiling. Good. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Michelle. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thank you. It's um, it's dark here. I'm in London. It's about nine thirty in the evening. Yeah, I'm like it's pretty late. Where you, well, not pretty late. I guess it all depends on your perception of late. <laughs> but it's definitely dark where you are. I would think. What's the weather been like for you guys? You had that heat wave go through, didn't you? Um, I honestly can't remember. It feels to me like we haven't had a summer at all. It's just been grey but that could just be world events. Oh yeah, I understand. This whole summer has been just like gong show of what happened. <laughs> so, but uh, what definitely did happen is you got a story in this book. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and your story is called, sorry, this is why I need to write stuff down, but I was like, oh no, it'll be cooler if I could just like look at it. <laughs> Who's that trip trapping? Now, did you want to, I'm just going to throw you in. Or did you want to like introduce the story first before you start talk, reading it? Do you know what, you do what you want to do? Sure. I'll start doing a brief reading. Okay. Sounds great. So I'm going to start my reading with the beginning of the story. Um, it's called, Who's That Trip Trapping? 
Bank station gets its claws into you, doesn't let you go without a fight. It's a Monday, unremarkable in every way. Grey stagnant clouds hanging low in the sky, blotting out the shard, the promise of planes taking off from city airport. There's nothing up there, just the mean face of the sky promising rain. She'd changed outfits twice before leaving the house, one too optimistic, the other now too pessimistic it's always too hot on the tube. Everyone knows that. Samantha, not Sam to her friends, nor ever, she hates the feeling of being reduced, is sweating through her blouse and into her suit, crushed up against two tall banker types with the long umbrellas that told everyone they barely had to walk more than a pavement width between office and black cab. She tries not to make it obvious as she sniffs. She doesn't smell, not yet, but she's running late. We'll have to choose between a pret almond croissant and escaping a lecture. The tube screeches around the curved platform like nails down a chalkboard and Sam squeezes her eyes closed, feeling the beginnings of a headache. As the train begins to slow, she surfs down the aisle, wobbling a little on stiletto heels, murmuring a constant refrain of, sorry, excuse me, and thank you, as she butts up against similarly sweaty fellow commuters. The meaningless little open buttons on the train doors hurry aside as the doors part, exhaling warm damp air and sucking in the dull, dry, underground smelling air of bank. People are already massing on the platform. Samantha says, excuse me, again, and with a burst of irritation decides to keep her elbows out, give anyone who tries to push past her a nasty surprise. A man swears, looks accusingly at her. She thinks, serves you right. Mind the gap, says the ridiculously well-spoken man over the loudspeaker and Samantha is buoyed up by the wave of bodies around her. Suits and umbrellas and briefcases and horrors, wheelie bags. There's a bottleneck by the way out and she finds herself trapped in the eddy of the crowd next to a large poster about a missing child. The picture is grainy and the child is surprisingly ugly, wearing a cable knit jumper and a little heart shaped charm bracelet. Michelle has been missing since she was 14. That was nine years ago. Michelle is dead, Samantha mutters, thinking longingly of a flat white. It isn't a bad thing to think. It's simply the truth. Better dead than the other sad possibilities. The stairs up to the next level are a seething mass of black and pinstripe, and Samantha's shoes click and scrape on the hatched metal. One of the heels has worn down to the nub and that's it. She's going to have to get them rehealed. And it's so unfair when there's barely a moment in Samantha's life that isn't tube and office and gym and hello fresh. There's just no time for chores. She thinks that if she disappeared, it would take a bloody long time for them to notice. Perhaps that's why she misses the interchange. The signs around Samantha go from black and green yellow to red and brilliant cobalt blue. Gates are closed at the mouth of the Waterloo and City Line orange jacketed staff with clipboards and walkie talkies. She's gone the wrong way and she presses her mouth into a tight hard line and turns around. Hey, someone says as Samantha swims back against the tide, raises a hand in apology and gets back on the escalator. The crowd ebbs and falls with the arrival and departure of trains. This must be a moment of low tide because no one else is on the escalator with her except the tail end of a school trip halfway up the teacher looking ready to pack it all in before 8am. She pulls out her phone and says, shit, just loud enough for the children to hear. One of them cackles. And coming from under the escalator, there's an answering laugh, dry as old bones. That's the end of the beginning. Beginning. <laughs> yeah, your story was very, yeah. I don't want to give a lot of it away. It's really creepy when he gets into it. It's like it's the slow build. He really builds like a lot of um, imagery imagery of the the train station. Thank you. I think about what you would call it, but I can't. <laughs> well, I um 
I used to have to commute through Bank Station quite a, quite a lot. And anyone who's gone there um, often will tell you it is an absolute maze down there. It is so easy to lose your way. It's so easy to get turned around. And every time I got lost down there, I thought, oh, my God, this is some sort of portal to the underworld. And that's really what the story is about. So it is. So is that where the inspiration kind of kind of came from? Is the um, the idea of that of how you can get lost or trapped? Yes, it was. Um, it was a mixture of how spooky and recursive the tunnels seem to be. They just seem to go around in circles and go nowhere, and also how towering and wide the escalators seem to be and I just became fascinated with the idea of what what would you do if you heard a voice coming from the other side of the escalator because that's obviously physically impossible yeah or is it <laughs> so Nina goes "Ooh, what a place to end uh, Ali awesome and then Emily Thank also you. goes creepy and I agree thanks for reading Yes, thanks for reading, Ellie. No, it's just because um, we all have different subway stations, and I'm I I have barely used the subway in like um, in Toronto, but when I do, it's oh, Puppy was supposed to be put away. <laughs> That's Kala. <laughs> she has a very loud bark, so I try to like shush her. Oh, I left her outside, and it just started raining. That's why she's in. Someone let her in. Um, yeah, so the it's it's there's yeah, subways. Do you call them subways or train stations? What is it? Um we we call it it's London Underground, we just call it the tube, so back to tube station. I was trying to think, but I couldn't say it out loud because I couldn't figure it out. Okay. Um perfect. Well, no, thanks so much for like submitting that story. I love how it just um because yours isn't necessarily because a lot of people did it off of um with the call did like a physical door and yours is more um like a door not necessarily a doorway but um something else so i love how it has that little um it's not quite exactly as all the other stories in it so i love how it has like that little mix um in there the the idea of the door doesn't have to be an actual physical door and i think that's that's brilliant and thank you so much um, for thank putting you. that in. Um, we've got two stories left to do. I'm just gonna go say goodbye for right now. Thank you again so much and we'll uh, we'll bring everyone back out again at the end. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Who would like to go next? Cause I forgot to get the next one. Is it gonna be David or Adam? All right, okay, Dave's giving me a thumbs up. So here we go. Sorry, Adam, I didn't see, too late, it's too late. <laughs> like, like you didn't thumbs up fast enough, Adam, and I was like, but. I know, like, quick off the draw. I, I forgot to go in there and be like, hey, who wants to go next in the <laughs> private chat? Um, but uh, is it you that's making the noise? No, I think we're okay. So I was hearing, hearing feedback, but I think it could have been the people over there. <laughs> so this is your second time being in one of the doors, isn't it? It, it is, yeah. I've been in, <clears throat> I was in C. Yeah. And then on this one, yeah, this is that's the two. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And your story, if I can hear, is till death do us part. Uh, and are you good for doing a small reading today? Yes. yes. I am. Then I'm going to leave you the room. <laughs> I'll see you in a bit. <laughs> so um, this one, I'm going to start reading kind of a little way into it. Um, and it's just to give you a bit of context, it's about a character called Kate, who is um, a delivery driver. Um, she's having kind of uh, marriage problems and um, she wants to get home at the end of her delivery run just to kind of have like a special evening and kind of like, you know, make a bit of a, Try and give a go of a marriage, basically. Um, and, uh, yeah, so she's kind of gone out to this very secluded um, ranch to, to drop off a delivery. So that's where we're going to kind of start from. Kate turned and took a step towards the van. 
but a creek made her freeze. Hello there. You can't be working in the basement. Thanks for waiting. I'm running low on supplies. Kate looks over her shoulder at the voice. A grey-haired, respectable man in beige overall smiled at her, wiping his hands on a rag. She felt a weight lift from her stomach as she returned his grin. She enjoyed chatting with old men. They reminded her of her dad and how she missed him. She and Dan waited so long to marry, not having her father walk down the aisle stuck out as her biggest regret in her life, one she punished her husband for, which she knew wasn't fair. She delayed their wedding day more than he had. Hey, no problem. My docket says you want to count the inventor. The man hesitated, blinking, then looked away from her face. You okay? You're Joseph Collins, aren't you? He stuffed the rag into his pocket. Yes, that's me. Sorry, it's just... Don't get many visitors out here. Counting my order, hope that isn't a problem. Kate smiled again. No, happens all the time. It's in the truck. His footsteps followed as she walked down the stairs, a spring in her step. She'd be on the road again soon, and that meant just two more stops before a night in with Dan, saving their relationship, she hoped. Kate's stomach twisted at that prospect. How had they let it drift so much? When had they stopped communicating other than the endless sniping and passive aggressive remarks? She didn't know if they could get back to the start game. Didn't know if it were possible, but she wanted to try. Joseph's voice caught her attention, but she missed the words. Sorry, miles away. He laughed. No problem, miss. I just asked. You had a busy day? Sorry, things on my mind. Quiet out here. Makes my thoughts wander. The old man chuckled once more as she led him to the back of the truck. Sure, plenty of time to think out here. No doubt about that. Say, what's your name? She paused at the vehicle's rear, eyeing Joseph. He stared back, face open, an amiable smile twinkling in his eyes. I guess I know yours. What's the harm? Name's Kate. Joseph's face slackened just for a moment, so fast she thought it could have been her imagination. That steady grin swam back to the surface in the blink of an eye. But she saw it. You okay? My wife's name is Kate. What a coincidence, eh? She gonna come out and help you count? His eyes didn't leave hers. He didn't even blink. She's dead. Despite the spotter and heat, Kate's skin chilled. The way he stared at her, the flat tone and how he spoke those words like a reflex. She could sense Joseph's pain on the still air and she put her foot right in it. I'm, I'm sorry, she stammered. I didn't mean anything. How could you know? Please don't worry about it. Years have passed. Joseph nodded at the truck. My delivery? Kate fumbled for a fob to unlock the doors, change the subject. Anything, just say some words that won't remind him of his dead wife. Images of Dan swam into her mind with the unbidden thought of losing him forever. She shoved that away. The door swung open, revealing two stacks of boxes for Joseph, 20 in total. Uh, I don't make a habit of asking, but what is this? I'd be curious since they loaded my truck this morning. She watched as Joseph ran his eyes over the delivery, counting each box before he nodded. Borax. You know what that is? Kate fired up a handheld scanner, prepping it for his signature. It so happened she knew the chemical. My daddy used it to treat fungal infections in horses' hooves, but I don't see any around here. Joseph chuckled and took the device, their fingertips brushing. He didn't seem to notice. He squiggled his signature and laid the scanner back in the, tr the truck on the top of the pile of old paperwork. That's one use, sure. It's versatile, quite a marvellous substance. I need it as a preservative. With a sigh, Kate pulled her dolly from the truck and hauled the boxes on it. It would take her two trips. Taxidermy? Sure. Joseph eyed the boxes again. Do you have a spare dolly? I can take the other stack. It'd be my pleasure. You don't mind? Kate asked, already pulling her spare from the back. Joseph did offer, and the day's heat made her shirt stick to her skin. Thanks. They made quick work of the stacking, of stacking the boxes of borax, and were soon wheeling them back to Joseph's house. Kate didn't look forward to hoisting them up onto the porch, but she'd back, be back on the road in no time. The next two drop-offs were small enough to slip through a mailbox. Traffic permitting? She'd be home in time to freshen up and order food before Dan returned. How long have you been married? The question made a stumble as they approached the porch. Forgive me, I saw the wedding band on your finger. And I have details, eh? I guess that comes with taxidermy. Three years in September. 
Kate and I were married for 40. The dollies crunched in the dirt as they came to a stop before the porch. Kate's heart went out to him. She remembered her daddy when her mom passed, had passed, how he lived like a shadow until he followed her. He must have got hitched young. Joseph picked up the boxes four at once. Kate's eyebrows rose. The old man was stronger than he looked by far. Teenagers, both just 18, high school sweethearts. These past five years have been tough, but my work distracts me well enough. Do you mind helping me bring these into the house? My wallet's in there, you deserve a tip. Kate grabbed the two boxes and followed him up the stairs. It looked like he could carry more of these, but she didn't see the harm. It's not company policy, but what, what they don't know, her words broke off as she and Joseph approached the open front door. Familiar music drifted out from inside. You like Waylon Jennings? No way, me too. Joseph shrugged and paused as Kate moved ahead of him into the house. My wife and I saw him plenty of times. I have a few of his LPs signed too. Would you like to see them? Kate bit her lip. Her eagerness to get back on her route and finish a delivery nipped at her. But how could she not say how could she say no to sign Jennings LPs? It wasn't like she could get any of hers autographed. He's been dead for almost 20 years. A record player stood near an armchair in a corner, shelves of LPs and books surrounding it. Wood panels lined the walls of the large, open-plan living area, and a cosy-looking maroon carpet ran across the floor. Kate spied two archways leading off into the back of the house, and a white door in the far corner. Even from where she stood, she saw the latch and bolt locking it. Where do you want these, she asked, glancing over her shoulder. By the door over there. Kate nodded and glanced at the walls again a missing detail jumping out at her. That your workshop? I thought you'd have this place filled with animal heads and all that. She laid the boxes down by the door with, a, with care and a sigh. She spun around, hands on her hips. Joseph stood a step, to, took a, stood a step toward her, his hands behind his back. I never said I was a taxidermist. Kate had no time to react. He threw himself at her, slamming her into the white door. It rattled with their impact. She thought she heard muffled screams from the other side, but Joseph's hands grabbed her head, a cloth in his hand pressed against her face. Waylon Jennings continued to croon. Her thoughts swam as she struggled, images of Dan arriving home finding it empty. Strength left her limbs as she faded into darkness. And that's where I shall leave that one. For now. Hello. That was great. Thank you so much. So we, we do have some people commenting. Uh, hi, this is great. <laughs> Thanks for reading, David. And Nian says, oh crap, David, the creepy vibes are strong in this one. Oh, they are, are they? They might be. <laughs> so you went with a literal door. I did, I um, had a literal door. Yeah. But yeah. you also didn't, because um, a lot of our, a lot, a lot of the stories in this one did do a little more of the supernatural, paranormal kind of shift, where you went straight psycho. Yeah, it was kind of weird. Yeah, it's kind of weird because, like, I, I kind of have like a <laughs> for the for the it call series. I kind of like just went for this streak where I was like, I'm just gonna send really weird stuff. Yeah. All the time, right? And then, um, and then, so for this one where it was like doors, where it could be like, you know, you could get a little bit weird and do like portals and dimensions. And I just was like, you know what? I'm just going to just do the most normal horror story that I've probably ever written ever. And uh, I don't know, I don't know why, but you know, it was, uh, it might have just been after a, I think, I think I wrote it when we were in like this lockdown that had gone for like six months. And it was like, I, I'm just losing my mind, I think. <laughs> yeah. But in reality though, um, because it, it didn't go into the weird and the cosmic, um, it did stand out. And I think it, it did, uh, like it, it went dark enough in like a really good way for people that enjoy horror, like obviously. Yeah, not a yeah, big fan kidnapping, yeah. probably not gonna like it, but yeah, yeah, that's 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 it. Yeah, like and it, it is like you know, it it does kind of play on some some tropes a little bit, and there is like a couple of twists in, in, in the story as well. But um yeah, um I, I mean I, I was quite happy with, with how it turned out. It's nice and kind of violent and you know, there's a you know, a few nice kind of tense scenes in it. Uh, but yeah, it was um I kind of I think I actually when I was gonna start doing the one for doors, I had this big grand idea of this really weird 
epic kind of thing. And then this just really kind of, um, you know, pretty much classic horror story came out of it, really. So. Yeah. No, I think it worked really well. And again, you can buy that in this. So people yes. can find out what the heck we're talking about um, <laughs> right here. It's on sale of the digital uh, for $1.99. It's on Kindle Unlimited and you can get paperback or hardcover anywhere. Um, Emily would like to know, where did the idea come from? Oh, well, <laughs> I don't know. Um, my my twisted, twisted mind. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's, it's very much, in, it's very much about marriage and, um, you know, and uh, the trials and tribulations of marriage <laughs> in, a, in a lot of ways. I mean, it's called, it's called Till Death Do Us Part. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, and, and you have the, the, the main characters that are in it are at various different stages of, of relationships. And um, yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's where it kind of, that's where it kind of came I love from. it. I love that idea. And she also says scary because uh, it could happen, which um, again, if people are going to read it, it could happen. Make Always happen. carry a knife. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, so we are going to um, say goodbye for for right now and bring you back up after. Uh, but thanks again for reading and for submitting. Like I really enjoyed the story, and it did. It definitely hit those um, creepy, chilly vibes while I was reading it. I was like, oof, I could just see some creepo. I enjoyed it a lot. So. No, please, thank you. Um, and now we have, last but not least, Adam H. Douglas, who is going to read their story. Um, oh, you are reading, right? Or you just want I am to... reading. Okay. Yes. Yeah. There Unless we go. anybody has an objection. Your story is named as Hollow. Um, and again, it can be found in this beautiful, <laughs> this beautiful book right here. Did you want to chat? Do you know what? I'm going to let you go um, by yourself. Sure. And you can um, just have some fun. Sure. Um, in there. Sounds good. I have, um, this is slightly into the book or into the story. Um, this is a story about a young man named Kyle who is um, received a message from his uh, estranged uncle who has estranged himself from the rest of the family due to some nastiness that he did. And um, he wants to, he wants his nephew to come to see him on uh, what he says is going to be his last days alive. And so we pick up from there. He had to watch where he stepped on the rotting porch, afraid it wouldn't hold his weight for long. The front door had a stained glass window set in the center with several colored planes cracked or missing. He knocked. When the door opened, Kyle thought it was a stranger who answered. The last time he had seen his uncle, Bob had a had an athletic physique like a swimmer. The man who answered the door was a shadow of his uncle. He was very gaunt, had probably lost 60 pounds, maybe more. His once immaculately coiffed hair was ragged and falling out, and his eyes were sunken and roomy. He was an old man of 55. But the most alarming aspect of his appearance were, were the cuts and scratches that cross-hatched his face and hands. Ugly, ugly red lines and gouges peppered the exposed surfaces of his gray, sallow skin. It was as if his divorce had really had been a death by a thousand cuts. Kyle guessed a bad fall or similar accident. But if there had been any doubt whether Bob was truthful about it being near the end, it vanished as soon as he saw him. Hey, kiddo, Bob smiled in a weak yet relieved way. Wasn't sure you'd show up. Uncle Bob. Kyle greeted him, repeating the old joke, hoping it hit his shock well enough. I said I'd come. I meant it. Bob extended his hand, and Kyle shook it. The grip was firm, but Kyle recoiled slightly at the bony fingers, touching death of a voice set in his head. He ignored it. There was a distinct smell of booze on his breath. At least some things haven't changed, he thought. Come on in, kiddo. Bob moved aside so that Kyle could enter. The wallpaper was threadbare on every wall, and there were signs of decades of neglect everywhere he looked. It was as if no one had lived there for at least 60 years before Bob showed up. Not much, I know, his uncle said as perhaps a kind of apology. But the real value is in the land. Let's go to the kitchen. I got to sit down. His uncle moved slowly down the hallway. 
and I ended up in the kitchen lit by a single bulb hanging from a broken fixture on the ceiling. A wooden table sat next to a steam radiator with two chairs. Bob sat, groaning slightly. Death sucks, kid. Try to avoid it, he laughed. A manila envelope lay on the table next to a bottle of wild turkey and two glasses. He pulled it towards himself. An ashtray filled to the brim with butts and ashes sat next to his elbow with a half-used packet of Du Maurier's open nearby. Bob opened the envelope and pulled out some official-looking papers. Just got to put your name here and everything goes to you, like I promised. Kyle grimaced. Hey, you don't have to do that right now. I mean, that's not the reason I'm here. Not the main reason, anyway. Bob looked at him and smirked. You don't have to pretend. It's okay. Your mom would probably shit a kitten if she knew you were coming to see me. I really don't care if it's just for the money. I'm just glad you're here. Kyle sat opposite his uncle. No, I'm serious. He took a deep breath. Look, I'm not going to lie. I almost turned around when I came here. I mean, I'm just as mad as you as everyone else is, okay? Kyle wasn't looking at him while he spoke, but he could tell the man grew very still. But you treated me pretty good when I was younger, talked to me like I mattered, like I was an adult. That meant something to me. Kyle paused. What you did to Aunt Tony was pretty fucking horrible. I'm not letting you off the hook for that. No way. He looked at him now, but Bob's expression was unreadable. But when it comes down to it, I came here because I think, well, no one should have to die alone. If you can be there for somebody in their final days, you should be with them no matter what went on before. That's why I'm here. Kyle had said it so well, he almost believed it himself. Who knew? It might have even been kind of true. Bob didn't move or say anything for a few minutes. Finally, he said, damn, kid, damn. He filled in Kyle's name on the will. Then he signed it at the bottom, pulled a cigarette from the pack, lit it with his lighter from his pocket, and dropped it on the table. I knew I was right about you. They smiled at one another. Kyle's more shyly than his uncle. Kyle tried hard not to think tried hard not to think about the money, how much he needed it, even if it wasn't going to be very much. To think about the money at that moment seemed like a betrayal. Finally, Bob said, I did, however, lie about something. Kyle's smell, Kyle's smile fell. What? The value of my estate. Tony got pretty much everything in the divorce. What was left over went to medical expenses for me and then buying this house. Speaking of which, yeah, I know it's total shit. I didn't buy the place for the ambience. You probably have to pay to, get, to have it knocked down. There's no value here. I also said the land here, about 50 acres or so, might be worth about 100000 That ain't exactly exact. Bob, I really don't care. It's likely worth millions. Billions, maybe. Kyle had no idea what to say to that. Bob grinned. Let me take a couple of the pep pills my doctor gave me. They should give me just enough energy for us to go for a walk. I've got something very important to show you. It's probably the most important thing you'll ever see in your entire life. Here we go. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you so much for reading that. I really... Um... Like, I love where this story goes and like the, the buildup of this character being such um, an sure. asshole. Yeah. <laughs> well, neither one of them are particular. Like, they, there's things about both of them because I don't like yeah, characters like, who are all. Neither of them are 100% little... redeemable. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody, like every person alive, you have your good and your bad. And you're never fully, you're almost not fully one or the other they're so yeah. rare they might as well not exist so i like that i agree I, I like i like trying to put some of that into a character if i can no it's and that's the the great thing about especially what i liked about this one is that the characters did seem like people like they said they they talked like humans they they seemed like their interactions together and their backstory that you built in uh, seemed, 
relatable in some senses, which is what I think needs to happen in a horror story, especially because you need to have someone to cheer on, even if you hate them. Um, yeah. Because you have to kind of visualize yourself in at least one of them. Um, so I really enjoyed where where the story went. Thank um, you. It was very nice. Yeah, Thank I you. think it was really, really interesting. Um, we had someone write something. Oh, Emily, I wrote, uh, are your characters based on anybody? Um, there's always a little bit of me in every character. Uh, which in in this case doesn't sound very nice, but uh, I know. Like, yeah, but um, okay. I, they're not based on any particular person. Uh, they're I sort of take bits and pieces from people that I meet all the time and just uh, use what works and discard what doesn't. Yeah. No, totally. Um, but yeah. Um, so the inspiration on this one was it? Where did it come from? Um. My two areas. One is um, quite a fan of uh, Japanese. I don't keep going. Quite, I, why not? Uh, uh, I'm quite a fan of Japanese uh, stories and Japanese uh, media. My wife uh, yeah. is studying Japanese, and she's introduced me to a lot of great um, Japanese horror, which is uh, almost should be a genre unto itself. It's just so creepy, and it has such a distinct uh, style to it. Yeah. Um, when I was in university, I had to create a, a sculpture that had um, this sort of concept of what was evil. And there was a black sort of uh, thing that you looked into is just pure void inside. And it sort of reminded me when I was trying to think of uh, something going to the door. Um, and so I, probably the absolute nothingness i thought was probably one of the scariest ideas um i'm giving a little bit of away uh but um this is uh, where it started yeah well that's really interesting so um but yeah we don't want to give too much away so we're going to be like um, yeah <laughs> but I, I i definitely like it definitely had that creep creep vibe to me and like the twist that came at the end uh I really enjoyed and I hope that our readers really enjoy it as well. Um, but thank you so much for reading and for submitting. And I'm so glad I was able to publish this um, in this collection. It's so I really enjoyed it. I think everyone else will as well. So yeah. right now I'm going to play a little bit. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a commercial come up. Very quick one. And then we're going to come back and everyone else is going to be on the stream with us. Um, and we'll have a quick wrap up with everyone. But uh, see you in just a minute. Let's see uh, our second trailer for It Calls From The Doors. Very cool. Thank you. Very well done. Yeah. Um, Chris, you were unmiked. You're muted and you're muted and you're muted. But anyways, <laughs> some people still have their mutes on. But thank you so much, Chris. He did that one as well. That's awesome. Yeah. Epic, yeah. epic, epic. I've That's had so nice. many people commenting on it. Now we just need that many people to keep buying the book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> buy the book. <laughs> you liked it, buy if the book. If you like this, you're going to love the book. <laughs> um, we got a comment. Brilliant reading, everybody. And I agree. Such, like, the variety of stories that came in this book um, just really amazed me. Like, I think everyone's got some really unique um, ideas and where all of your twisted little minds go, I just love it. So thank you so much. <laughs> Um, if anyone has any questions, throw them in right now. We're going to try to wrap up um, really quickly, not really quickly, but a couple questions. Um, we've got Richard Clive that says, Chris, the trailer is amazing. Both are well done. I agree. Oh, well done all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, this was a lot of fun. And I, again, I love how all of these um, 
stories and different even subgenres of horror have kind of made it in like we've had slasher and psychological and um I'm trying to think if we had body horror i think we might have had one in there that's slightly body horror um which is kind of cool what i want to know uh for you guys do you have any rituals um like writing rituals that you do um that kind of like gets you in the the horror writing mood. Let's start. Let's start with Adam because we. That's that's where. Well, I'm going to take that comment off so we can see everyone's names. Sure. Um, first thing in the morning, usually the best time to write. Um, fresh brain, wake up, and being able to sit down. I um, I have a day job, so unfortunately, I usually have to do that first. So. Uh, but if I can uh, spare a day to sit down and start writing immediately, I find that's my best uh, time to write and uh, as quiet as possible, as few distractions as possible. Yeah, I know for me, I personally can't write if there's anything going on. I think it's my ADH brain. I'm too like distracted. Like sometimes I can't even have the dog in the room with me because I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like squirrel, but for <laughs> He sneaked in. He has sneaked in. I know she's, she's behind in. you. I don't know. I was. She was pacing, and I was like, "Get on the couch <laughs> or the chair." Um, Chris, do you have any writing rituals for you? Um, not really. I I, I tend to write um, uh, sort of during the day, um, unless it's really interesting, at which point I just keep writing until it's done late into the night. But I tend to listen to a lot of music. Um, when I'm writing a lot of sort of mood music. So if I'm writing something sort of dark, we're not listening to um, pop music. Um, yeah. So I find that helps in terms of, you know, it kind of ends up on the page, I think, in places. But uh, yeah, in terms of rituals, not really, apart from writing at the same time every day, every day. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, Good for is, you. Well, <laughs> it's easy when you haven't got a job to go to. <laughs> <laughs> I well, I don't have a well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just the one job that's running yeah. you ragged. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing I leave the house for, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people who can say that these days. Yeah. <laughs> um, how about you, David? Do you have any uh, writing rituals that get you in the mood specifically for horror? Because I know you write a couple different genres, which I. Um, I, I do. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the same for anything that I write, really. I, I, like like Chris, I, I listen to, to music, um, but I'll kind of, a lot of it will be soundtracks. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll listen to kind of like a soundtrack that is similar to what I'm writing. So if it's, you know, fantasy, I'll listen to a fantasy soundtrack or horror, I'll listen to like, you know, Halloween or something like that, you know. Um, but what I what I realised this year and especially over the summer is that I really need structure to the point where it's like I have to like kind of chart how many words I've done today and how many words I did yesterday, like properly, like a beautiful mind level kind of like charts everywhere. Um, because I, I just kind of uh, I, I if I don't, I just kind of get too um, unfocused. I think so. I just need to really kind of treat it like an actual like proper job otherwise my brain just doesn't seem to um <clears throat> to, to work <laughs> as well. yeah. uh, which is which is fine because i actually I, I do like structure so yeah I, I do that quite a lot yeah what about you rachel or do you have any sort of ritual or structure that you have to do um i i, I would love to have some kind of structure and plan and and practice um, it's really free form. Um, yeah. usually, usually ideas will start in a notebook and I'll just have that with me and it sort of, you know, something comes to me and I'll start scribbling when I actually start working on something and expanding it, that's usually on the computer. And then I start like David and like Chris, I'll pull in background music. Um, I like some sort of for horror, something ambient and sort of creepy, like, um, delirium there, there were their music tends to work pretty well for that. Yeah. So. Very cool. I'm just imagining all of you guys listening to like Chainsaw Massacre stuff like, ah! 
That's what I would listen to if I could listen to music while I did anything. <laughs> um, Ali, do you have any sort of structure or um, ritual that you kind of have to do in order to get into the vibe? Um, I'm a bit different in that I have to write in total silence. Um, I can't have anything on in the background. It's too distracting. But what's most important is tea. Tea, <laughs> tea is an absolute crucial component of the creative process. Does it have to be hot? I'm going to say yes, but that's only because I'm normally very cold. I know I normally have like a house coat and like three different drinks around me at different yeah. temperatures. Yeah, yeah, same here, same here. But I um, I also do, I think I'm sort of a combination of what people have been describing because like David, I'm very sort of, I like to track what I've done. I like to have a, you know, be able to look back and see the discipline. But also like Rachel, I'm a very notebooky person as well. I sort of flip backwards and forwards between a notebook and the computer. That's good. I love how everyone has just different things that work for them. And I don't think... Uh, when people are like, oh, this is how you have to do it. This is how you have to do it. You have to remember, like, writing is so personal. Like, you have to find what's going to work for you. And sometimes that is, like, for me, most of my plotting when I do write, most of my plotting is done pen to paper or in my head for, like, two months before I even touch my computer. Because, like, I need to work it out and, like, think it through before I actually start writing. Where other people, they're like, Oh, I have an idea. Do, 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 do. And they can get it done like within a week and I just want to murder them. Um, but whatever works for you, right? So it's just amazing how everyone has something that's totally different, which is great. Um, we do have one question. So we're going to get to this question. Um, and then we're going to just say goodbye. So if you opened a door and it entered the world in your story, what would you do? This is interesting because all of these worlds really are horrific. So, uh, so let's do where we ended and we'll just go around to back to where we started. Ali, if you opened a door to where your world was, what would you do? Besides just scream. I'd probably despair. It's, it's not a good place to be. You turn into a puddle and you're just like, no. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, I feel like that's how I would work too. You're so creepy. Uh, Rachel, what about you? I think knowing what I know about it, I would just shut the door again. <laughs> like, nope. 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 Thank you. Nope. <laughs> nope. 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 What about you, David? You're in the house. I'm in the house. I'm really interested in what Chris's answer is going to be to this one, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, what would I do? I would not become a delivery driver and deliver stuff to very remote locations. Um, I'd probably just drive in the opposite direction, to be honest with you, and just take off. Uh, that's what I would do. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Chris, what would you do? Um, yeah. I, um, I've actually, Monsters, Inc. Remember Monsters, Inc., when they got all those doors on a conveyor belt and they yeah. just start opening and running? Mm. That. And just try and find another door as quickly as possible. <laughs> That doesn't leave like you in some sort of story. hell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just, this one, that one, no. I feel like that's a good idea. Yours, yeah. I don't want to give away what your story is. It's interesting. Everyone should read it. You can read it now. Or, <laughs> Adam, what would you do with your door? You're in your story. Um, because it's sort of set in this area, I kind of li already live in where my story takes place. <laughs> so. I just hope the house that um, I hope the house and um, these characters can actually exist around me. But I think if I met them, I'd sort of go, "Nice to meet you. Bye." Goodbye. Yeah. That's perfect. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I honestly like. I love how this story, this book came out. And again, oh, I'll put the little banner up so people will know. Like I'm pushing everyone buy the book. It's a dollar ninety nine now which is actually the lowest that we've done a new release for the It Calls From series because it's October and it's spooky season. So I feel like everyone should be getting this for the spooky season. Uh, it's on Kindle Unlimited, paperback and hardcover. Um, but um, thank you so much for coming and like reading your stories and giving us some insight. It's always so nice to meet everybody. 
Um, not just because I never leave my house and I see no one, but because you're genuinely normally nice people, like, which is great. By the way, something's calling from my door. I just see if, uh, see if I'm right about this. And this will be embarrassing if this doesn't work. By the way. Oh, yeah. Oh, puppies. There we go. She's everyone here. in the back, yeah. everyone in the green room was like, show us your dogs. Yeah, I know. So I figured it, why not? All the commenters are going to be like, what's happening? But, <laughs> but thank you again. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. And oh my gosh, kisses. Yeah. Crazy. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to put that trailer up one more time uh, because it's amazing. And again, um, no, don't Thank you everyone just, for just leave in. it with the puppies. Leave it with the puppies. <laughs> <laughs> everyone wants to watch the dogs. Everyone wants to see this, Chris. Nobody cares about the humans. As soon as the dog shows up, it's like it is a dog show. Now. I'll see if I can get her new nails. Thank you, everyone. We got a well done, everyone, from Richard, and of course, me wrote puppy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you so much for joining and thank you for watching us live. It's always amazing to be able to do this, but not only just for us, so we get to like chit chat, but also for you guys, so we can share our work with you and get to know, uh, so you guys can get to know us a little bit, which is um, great. So thank you again, another great stuff. Um, and thanks, amazing. Now I'm gonna put the trailer on, I promise. Okay. All right, thank you everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Yeah, I just have to find the trailer. There it is. Bye.